Death by overwork. A young woman in Japan commits suicide after working more than 100 hours overtime. And she's not alone. Thousands do the same there every year. Can the culture change? And what happens in other countries? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Sahil Rahman. The Japanese have a word for it, karoshi, death linked to exhaustion. When a 24-year-old woman jumped to her death in December last year, she left a note for her mother saying, why do things have to be so hard? She's been working about 100 extra hours per month. Now, the company advertising group Denshu has been under pressure to reduce the amount of overtime its employees do. And in November, it was raided by labour regulators. The government ruled that the woman's death had been caused by overwork, and this prompted her boss to resign. About 2,000 Japanese people a year take their own lives for the same reason. Well, let's bring in our guests in Shuzoka, Japan, Shiriju Takashita, Professor of School of Management and Information at the University of Shizuoka. In Paris, Anne Elizabeth Mutet, a columnist for the UK Sunday Telegraph. And in Gothenburg, Sweden, City Councillor Daniel Bernmar. Thank you to all of my guests for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. Uh, Shijiru, can we just start with you in uh, Japan there. I mean there is a great deal of cultural reference uh, and influence to being employed and deference perhaps the further east you travel certainly from Europe uh, the more respect is given to a company and to a boss you know sort of a, a thank you for employing me so therefore the pressure is on to perform. Well actually in case of Japan that is particularly so considering that we still have a very strong influence of lifelong employment and seniority system. Now many people say that's thrown away but that is not true particularly for large companies, large traditional companies like in case of Dentsu which also is not influenced so much by the external factors. Uh, for example, advertising agency. So for these reasons um, there still is the and the negative side, the tradition that goes on, of course, it's not all negative. There's no reason why Japan has, well, stepped up from sure. uh, rags to riches. Um, but uh, I don't mean to interrupt because there's quite a few questions I want to ask you before we, we expand the conversation to our guests in Europe. Are those cultural norms being revisited? It's being rethinked over, um, but unfortunately, the structure is such that it is very difficult to turn it around as there is a lot of vested interest that is involved not to turn it around. And for that reason, the whole cultural aspect, I think, is uh, uh, unfortunately uh, going to continuously uh, give birth to these kind of uh, very, very sad incidents. OK, so it, we'll talk more, of course, with our European guests shortly. But also, just finally, before I go to them, from your own personal view and how you saw this story unfold in Japan, just tell us about the enormity, how it resonated with your friends and family when you're talking about it over the dinner table or with your work colleagues or with people on the bus or in a taxi. Okay, to be perfectly honest with you, those of us who've actually worked in these Japanese industries, well, this is nothing new. And uh, I can clearly tell you that this is going to happen again and again and again. This was particularly big news because it was an elite company by a young, beautiful lady who was brought up by a single mother. So it's a really sad incident. So, of course, it was highlighted. But we all know that, as you reported, Karoshi is there and it's there to stay for quite some time going forward. Well, let's give our viewers uh, around the globe a little bit of background now on what's going on, because Japan isn't the only country where employees work long hours. They spend about 1,700 hours a year at work, but that's actually just an average compared to the rest of the countries in the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. People in Mexico, Costa Rica and South Korea work the longest. Employees in Norway, the Netherlands and Germany work the least, though statistics show that hasn't actually hurt productivity. The French government wants to reform labour laws to lengthen the work day and that's led to widespread protests. Meanwhile, the Scandinavian countries of Norway, Sweden and Denmark are known for their work-life balance and many employees have flexible work schedules and working overtime can be seen as an indication of poor planning. 
let's go to Sweden and to Daniel Bernmar, because for, for you, Daniel, where you are, the government and local authorities are, are trying to change this, and they've been experimenting for a number of years, as have you in Gothenburg, uh, to, you might say, some success. Yes, absolutely. We've been trying, uh, we've had a trial for a six hour workday uh, in a nursing home here in Gothenburg for the past two years. And it's proven to be very uh, good, both to quality and to working conditions and the health of to, the staff. To have that sort of situation, to, to say that you're doing so well, must have actually begun with having a problem and there you have to change your motives yes. and your reasoning for having a shorter working life. What were the problems for Swedes? Well, the problem when you look at the welfare sectors, which I represent, <clears throat> is mainly that we have a lot of female part-time workers uh, in blue-collar jobs, assistant nurses, uh, who work in home care and who works in uh, taking care of elderly people. And they are often working part-time, often uh, high sick leave rates. Uh, and when we started to looking into that, we see that the reason for them working part-time is that they don't really feel that they can work full-time because, uh, because of the bad working conditions. So from our perspective, each individual was paying their own uh, shortening of the work day because they can't work full time because of the working conditions. Okay. So from that perspective, it was important for us that it's not an individual problem. It's a collective problem. It's a problem we need to solve together. And uh, then shortening the work day, but keeping the same pay is one way of creating better working conditions. Okay, let's bring in uh, Anne Elizabeth Moutet in Paris. Of course, uh, it sounds very rosy up in northern, in northern Europe there, but that sort of scenario is resonating um, quite inadvertently in France. You've had suicides yourselves at certain companies uh, whose workers have felt disenfranchised, and there has been a, a growing resentment of l changes to labour laws and, and labour employment, has there not, Anne? Well, yes, but I mean, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry to say that France is the European champion of suicides in, 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 at work. Uh, about 500 people a year, and that has been a constant figure for decades. Um, um, and I date this back, I'm not sure, they, there have been statistics for longer, but it really dates back from when in the 80s, you had the, at the end of the 80s, you had this long uh, process of denationalization and reorganizing companies according to modern uh, uh, management techniques uh, for the private sector, and this was probably not explained well enough to the workers, or it was perfectly well explained and the idea was to get them to resign in, in, in depression, uh, in, in, in sort of, uh, to push them to resignation. Uh, this had, there have been examples in French company in which there had been courses for French bosses how to demoralize their employees in order to get them out. The company was France Telecom, now Orange, and uh, they had plans to, in 2006, when after Brussels regulation um, kicked them from being the state uh, phone company to a private uh, company, they were told that they had to shed one third of their employees on a workforce of uh, several tens of thousands. And they had objectives of people they had managed to demoralize enough that they would resign. And surely enough, you had about uh, 60 suicides over the years and their bosses are now in the dock. Uh, this didn't have to do with work hours, it had to do with the climate at work. And one of the reasons why in France you could get to this is that there's a French attitude of hierarchical uh, uh, defiance uh, which m uh, makes it easy for executives, middle level managers, etc. to uh, take this on and to say, fine, we will demoralize people. And strangely mm. enough, the, the fact that the French labor laws are very rigid mean that you try and think a way to circumvent firing people, and that would be forcing them to leave. Forcing them to leave is achieved with uh, 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 processes that are actually actionable by law. You've got uh, the former management of, of Orange Telecom in the dock right now. Um, uh, but it's something that exists in a less uh, uh, obvious way in other French companies. And I would say that this much more than, than the, the work week, the time of the work week is really what's at stake in French companies. Uh, the work week hasn't harmed productivity in, in large private companies. It has harmed productivity in rigid places, which were either small businesses or um, uh, um, uh, public businesses or formerly public businesses 
choices because they were not used to managing people in a different way. Sure. And sometimes the choices, as we can see, were made in the entirely wrong direction. Indeed. Um, there's also a very traditional French tradition of top down. We can talk about this later. If you like. uh, sure, that's no problem. Let me just bring in uh, Shajira here as well, in that the, the government, uh, actually, the very, uh, as uh, Anne, Anne Marie just, uh, Anne Elizabeth said, that the, the law in France is very tight on how you employ people and how you can sack them, fire them, make them redundant. The law is incredibly tight as well in Japan. But th at the moment, the government are trying to tighten uh, the way employers treat um, their uh, subordinates, you might say, so that it, they're, they don't, they're not abused, basically. I mean, it's a combination no, of the, the law being applied, it's, it's a combination of the law being applied and also cultural sensitivities, which are very difficult to try and uh, police. Well, you know, let me make one thing clear before we go further. The fact of the matter is, in the case of Japan, it's not necessarily performance and time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's how you contribute to your small group. Uh, this is based on our values of collectivism that comes from our very, very um, young age. And uh, many people feel the peer pressure of that. Now, in Japan, committing a crime or not abiding by the law is not as bad as breaking the societal rules that were set. Now, this is totally different from the West. And such values, which basically emphasizes very strong group thinking and group values, forces many of these people to really feel pressurized. Now, I can give you one case example. Do you know what the Japanese say when they come back from holiday? The first thing they say? No, they say, tell me. I'm sorry. They say they apologize to their peers. Now, you can see that this is because they feel that they may have possibly inconvenience their peers for taking a vacation. They feel a guilt sense of that. And you can see from that that one case example of how the grouping, the societal value is so different that we can continue to talk about laws being enforced, strengthened. Dentsu was already in a gray list for ages. But these aren't going to go away unless we change the fundamental idea about the values of individuals uh, within a group working ethics. It, 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 just very quickly, is it a partly is it a partly historical case that, and, and I go back now to the the end of the Second World War, that Japan perhaps you know was one nation that really had to rise out of the rubble, that the work ethic had to be there because you had no other option. You had to try and rebuild the country again, and that work ethic seems to have continued over the decades since uh, and it's about making yourself bigger better stronger uh, so you don't have to fall in those situations ever again and no it's a, actually a combination of many things but certainly that is certainly one of them but also the cultural values a societal value our collectivism values which has been built way before the world war ii but it's also true structurally yes these companies that basically try to enhance performance on a group basis on on a cluster competition is definitely something that was created after world war ii okay. daniel uh, in gothenburg let's bring you in here i mean okay. your experiments certainly with as a as a local official have been on on quite small numbers small groups which works for sweden you are a small population uh, but there have been sort of municipalities in the north of your country that have been trying this for 16 years with employees of employees of what 250 and it's not worked do you do you find that there is a, a a decent or a workable number that this type of scheme that you have works for rather than much larger numbers of employees no i think it works for any uh, number of employees it's not it's not the question of not working or working it's the question of what you're looking for and what you want out of the reform so it worked in Kiruna, uh, where they had 250 employees, but it of course costs, and the costs need to of course be reaped in benefits, and if the benefits are reaped by someone else than the employer, then you have a problem. In the case of Kiruna, it was the, em the employer didn't reap the benefits, because the benefits of more people working, the benefits of better working conditions, is mostly reaped by the national government, and the national government didn't want to pay for, the, for, for that project or for, for our project. So it was important for us to look into the public economy as a whole, looking both at which benefits do the national government reap and what benefits do we reap. So now we have those numbers. And that was one of the important things with this project that's been going on for the past two years in Gothenburg, to have the numbers, to know what are the actual benefits. 
Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Uh, no one did those numbers back in Kiruna. When you have those sorts of examples, where is the hope to try and translate it or to offer that guidance to other communities or other countries? I mean, are there, are there some countries or other areas that are no-hopers and some that would actually take on board what you've done and say, actually, you know, we could use this? Absolutely. We've seen uh, other examples, other municipalities or cities in Sweden also experimenting with uh, six-hour work days or shortening the work week to get a better working conditions because that's the main issue in some workplaces, especially in the blue-collar parts of the welfare state sector, which is basically nursing homes. But we also have social services with very poor working conditions where there are very high sick leave rates. And we, we see other municipalities and cities doing the same, experimenting, trying to find forms of shortening the work week or shortening the day to see what benefits they reap. And and no, please finish. You need to remember that there is also a cost uh, with having people on sick leave or having people uh, hospitalised even for, for poor working conditions. And, and Elizabeth, can I bring you in here? Because obviously France is heading towards general elections in 2017 and employment and, and work ethics will be part of the debate, I'm sure, amongst the um, presidential candidates. Um, the I an IMF report in 2016 actually employment suggested... Employment will be work ethic? I don't think so. No, an, an IMF report uh, suggested that France's employment laws do need to be overhauled. Uh, and, and whether it's, we describe it as work ethic or certainly dealing with the unions or employers, it, a, a comprehensive look at the way people are employed and people work has to be, has to be seen because France's growth rate is apparently not going to increase if, if it stays the way it is. Well, the thing is that ye, we have a formal system in which the unions are to be in talks with the bosses and, and, and the state in order to change the employment law. And there have been discussions on the last employment law, which uh, the, provoked a number of large demonstrations in the street. But basically, uh, there's an element of complete kabuki, if I may borrow a Japanese term, uh, because the unions now in France represent only 7% of the workforce. And if you discount the unions of the public sector, uh, then it falls to 3% of the workforce. They are not representative at all. They have become, uh, uh, they are very political. They've always been very political, but since they're not representative, they are into posture and not really about issues like those. Uh, and the issues are issues that are sort of very 20th century about time, you know, presence, time. This whole uh, wonderful uh, uh, the Swedish experiment that I was listening to, listening to thinking we are now working in the time when we're always connected and we have to reorganize entirely the way companies are being managed. There is an element of lip service that's being paid to this every now and then. And what happens usually in the French company is you get uh, consultants coming in and they say all those marvelous things. And then the boss says all those marvelous things again in his words. And everybody in the room, it's a bit like uh, an East German Communist Party meeting in the 1950s is you just think, OK, uh, uh, they are saying this and it will not happen to us. They're lying to us. And the, uh, uh, the culture in most French companies is toxic. And I say this having seen many French companies, public and private, and apart from a few exceptions, there's a, the whole dangerous tradition of basically treating your, your, your workers as people who have to obey uh, to you because uh, who might disobey and they are something between children and recalcitrant uh, uh, privates in the army. It's a very unpleasant system because society has changed. Right now there's something which is a bit different but which will tell you those things that can happen. There's a large chain of French um, hypermarkets, very good, called Auchan, good supermarkets, terrible working uh, conditions. They fired a woman who was not allowed to go to the to uh, uh, the bathroom more than twice a day, and that woman had a miscarriage in the bathroom, and they fired her after she had the miscarriage. And this is now getting on Twitter, but there are examples of people being fired because they 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 plug their phone uh, recharge to recharge their, for their, 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 their cell phone at the office. There are instances of people being fired again by Auchan, who have a bit of a bit of sort of uh, red light right now uh, because somebody uh, uh, had accepted a, a discount. Uh, uh, 
uh, bonus for 85 cents of euros uh, uh, from a customer who said, I won't use it, take it. And she was fired because of that. Mm. Uh, and the, the general attitude against workers is, first of all, it's so top down because the boss is God. You have three people under the boss who are jockeying for position to become the next boss. And then everybody else is treated absolutely like dirt. Again, there, have, you know, there are gradations in this. But the whole not invented here mentality, which was comprehensively debunked as early as the 80s by people like Tom Peters, do not exist in France. And there are many other work revolutions to which lip service was paid without anybody actually understanding what they meant. And there is a reason why France is a country in which, first of all, you get strikes on practically any, any instance. Uh, and the strikes are followed by people who normally would not follow them because what they are really doing is they are protesting in a kind of inchoate way against the way they were mm -hmm. treated. I'm lucky enough that I've worked in, in five countries in my life for five, you know, bosses of five different nationalities. And I can compare and I have great, I like the English system, but I have great admiration for the German system because the German system has got this element of consultation between actually powerful unions and the bosses and they get to results in a slow incremental way. That is actually something that could be applied in France with a large element of trust. Well, let me just bring you to you because you were actually, I think, nodding and agreeing with some of what uh, Anne Elizabeth had to say. But also, ironically, you know, there is a Toyota garage in southern Sweden that's actually uh, reduced its working hours. It's taken on uh, Japanese ethos in, in the workplace. It's seen more productivity, more profit. Uh, and we've seen that in the United Kingdom. There are also Japanese car factories there. Uh, there is a lot to learn from the Japanese way of doing things, but one wonders, uh, again, how the deaths of individuals through overwork mm. can sometimes mm perhaps make Japanese employers, would they ever take a step back and say, you know what, we, we have to rethink the way we treat our staff or the way, this deference that um, Anne Elizabeth also uh, mentioned, that you know, the boss is at the top, you come into work before him and you leave after he's gone home. Well, let me th make this clear again. Um, the thing is that power distance of Japanese workers versus the e management is extremely low. In fact, it's considered a norm for a president or executives to have lunch at their canteen. It's not a different canteen, it's the same canteen with factory workers. And there's also uh, hardly any, uh, this, this um, I'll say, um, uh, prejudice against, you know, blue collar workers versus white collar workers, for example. In fact, anybody who do that is very much frowned upon. Now, this tells you one thing, this is a very strong we mentality in Japan. We are in the same boat. We are in the same company. Therefore, you have to do your duty. You have to pay your tribute. You have to perform as a part of a group. Now, this is a pressure that is really imposed on these people. Uh, certainly, totally opposite, possibly, from the types of the French pressure that we're seeing, because it's not antagonism that we're seeing, like in the 50s, uh, labor versus the management. but it is the the peer pressure or internal pressure for one to be included and to perform as a member of the group. Now, to answer your question, the answer is obviously yes. Um, the Japanese methodology has worked very, very nicely throughout the growth areas, but obviously uh, we have reached a point where per capita sure. GDP is well over $45,000, so we really have to start introducing and including hybridization of our work, well, I would say performance okay. uh, base. That really has to change. OK, let me briefly ask uh, Daniel for a very final uh, question. I mean, you've heard what uh, Elizabeth had to say in France and Sergio in uh, Japan. What's the lesson that Sweden can teach, not just to European uh, governments, but also to, to the rest of the world about the way that uh, they can perhaps find a nice work-life balance? Well, I think the lesson is that uh, working more is not necessarily working better or working more efficient. So you can work less and but still do more. And I think that's that's the basic lesson. Um, looking at the OECD stats you were talking about earlier, that's one example of the fact that working more doesn't necessarily make a, a country richer. But working more efficient, uh, increasing productivity might be uh, one way where you actually can reduce work time and still uh, gets very much out of the labor market. You also need to think about how to create a sustainable labor market. It's been a discussion in Europe for many years. How do, how do you get people to work longer hours? How do you get people to work uh, with higher retirement ages? But we have 
lots of people not being able to work to 65, 67 or wherever your retirement age is because they're finished. Their bodies have said no. And uh, I think that's the important lesson that we can actually get people to work longer, uh, creating a sustainable work life, uh, but having them uh, doing less per day. OK, my thanks to all of our guests. We have to leave it there, I'm afraid, uh, to Shijiro Takeshita, to Anne Elizabeth Mute and Daniel Benmar. Thank you for joining me on this edition of Inside Story and thank you for watching the programme. Of course, you can see it again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com and for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter and our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sahil Rahman and all of the team, thanks very much for your time and your company.